All right. Good morning, fifth grade. Yesterday, we went through how the Spanish exploration changed the lives of people in the America. Now we're going to look at how just did European exploration affect the Americas. So all of European exploration. So let's go ahead and get us started. So it says the search for a Northwest Passage. Spain was not the only European country that sailed west to look for a shorter route to Asia. England, France, Netherlands, Portugal, and Sweden also sent explorers across the Atlantic Ocean. While Spain focused on exploring South America and the southern part of North America, the other nations explored the east coast of North America. They were trying to find a route to Asia through North America by using waterways, such as bays and straits. This supposed route was called the Northwest Passage. In 1497, just five years after Columbus's first voyage, John Cabot set sail on a voyage across the Atlantic. Cabot, in Italian, had received permission from the English king to sail west to explore the unknown lands. Cabot took along goods from merchants in the port of Bristol, England, and hoped to trade for Asian goods. All right, first let's go ahead and look at the picture here. It says Henry Hudson's, Henry Hudson's ship, the Half Moon, and we'll read a little bit more about Henry Hudson. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the um, timeline at the top here, which is what we'll kind of see throughout this lesson. We have John Cabot explores the eastern coast of what is now Canada while searching for the Northwest Passage, and that was in 1497. In 1524, we have Giovanni de Verrazzano reaches an area now known as New York Harbor. In 1534, we have Jacques Cartier claims land along the St. Lawrence River in France. In 1584, we have Queen Elizabeth I of England grants a charter allowing Sir Walter Raleigh to send a group of colonists to Roanoke Island. In 1608, we have Samuel de Champlain establishes the colony of Quebec for France. In 1623, we have the Dutch West India Company establishes the new colony of New Netherland. And then in 1638, we have the Swedish South Company forms a colony along the Delaware River. Let's start off with the picture over here. Just This is an oil painting of John and Sebastian Cabot. All right, so Cabot reached the North American coast somewhere in the region of what is now Newfoundland, an area in Canada. He could not find any people to trade with. What he did find were huge quantities of fish in the coastal waters. The English merchants were interested in this discovery. Dried fish was an important source of food at the time. Unfortunately, Cabot disappeared during his next voyage, probably the victim of a huge storm. Following Cabot's lead, Portugal sent sailors to the Newfoundland area. It established a small colony there as a base for fishing ships. Another Italian, Giovanni de Verrazzano, obtained the support of the King of France. Verrazzano traveled up the Atlantic coast. He explored areas including what are now New York Harbor and the mouth of the Hudson River. He had friendly encounters with Native Americans on his voyage. There's a picture here of Giovanni de Verrazzano. Verrazzano's next voyage was to Brazil, where he found a type of wood that is valuable in creating dyes for textiles. Verrazzano's voyages were overlooked in Europe, however. They occurred during the same decade that Spain conquered the Aztec Empire and brought large amounts of gold home to Europe. This here says the Hudson River, named for the English explorer Henry Hudson, and we're going to read about him here. Henry Hudson's voyages to the area that is now New York occurred in the early 1600s. Hudson was from England, but he worked for both England and the Netherlands. The Dutch East India Company hired Hudson in 1608 to try to find a shorter route to Asia. This company had been set up to increase Dutch trade with what is now Indonesia. 
1609, Hudson's ships reached the same area near New York that Verrazano had visited. Hudson sailed far up a river that was later named after him, the Hudson River. He concluded that it did not lead to a Northwest Passage because it became shallow as he moved north. Also, it contained fresh water, not salt water. Hudson returned to Europe and then began exploring for England in 1610. This time, his effort to find the Northwest Passage ended in disaster. He sailed into a bay in northern Canada, now called Hudson Bay. He became stuck in the ice and spent the winter there. He and his crew had had to eat spoiled food. When spring came and the ice melted, the crew took over the ship and put Hudson and his son in a rowboat with a few other crew members. They were never heard from again. The crew was arrested when it returned to England. So this is called mutinied. When your crew mutinies, um, they kind of turn against you. Um, so here you can see in this picture, it looks like during his second voyage to North America, Henry Hudson, his son, and others were abandoned in a rowboat after most of his crew rebelled. And then Henry Hudson um, and his crew, the rest of his crew that was on that rowboat were never seen again. So let's think about this. Why did the European explorers want to find a Northwest Passage? Okay, they wanted to find a Northwest Passage because they wanted to find a shorter route to um, India or to Asia. So remember, the whole idea was they wanted all these goods from Asia and they wanted a quicker way to get there. So that was why all these explorations were going on to begin with. New Netherland. In 1621, a group of Dutch merchants formed the Dutch West India Company. This company established the colony of New Netherland in 1623. This colony was the earliest European settlement in what is now New York State. The Dutch West India Company established the colony in that location because Henry Hudson had claimed the land for the Netherlands in 1609. The first settlements in New Netherland were established along the Hudson River. The Dutch colonists benefited from the rich resources in the area, particularly fur obtained by trading with the native peoples. In 1626, Peter Minuit became the colony's government, the governor. Some Dutch settlers established a profitable trading post on the southern tip of Manhattan Island. Minuit negotiated with the native peoples there to recognize and accept the Dutch settlement called New Amsterdam. Minuit offered the native peoples weapons, tools, and other supplies as part of the agreement. These goods were, were worth about 60 guilders or about $700 in today's money. But the native peoples did not believe that they were selling Manhattan. Because of communication difficulties, they thought they were agreeing only to share the land. This comes up again um, with those communication barriers and with the differences on owning land. So the Native Americans did not think you could own land. They thought, hey, you only, um, you, everybody lives on land, everybody shares the land. But again, the Europeans thought, no, we can own land so we can buy and sell it. So um, they thought that they were sharing the land, whereas um, Minuit and the Europeans thought they were buying the land from the natives. So New Netherland was one of the most diverse European colonies in North America. People of different religious and ethnic backgrounds were allowed to settle there. However, New Netherland was also one of the first colonies to bring enslaved Africans to North America. Fighting occurred between the colonists and the native peoples in the early 1640s. The governor of New Netherland, Willem Kuyft, was unhappy that the native peoples were moving into the northern part of New Netherland. And so this picture here shows the Dutch West India house that was built in the Netherlands in 1623. 
These peoples were trying to escape attacks by other Northeast Woodlands groups that were seeking to expand their territories. Against the advice of the other colonial leaders, Kieft sent Dutch soldiers to attack native villages. The result was a series of attacks by both sides that left hundreds dead. Many Dutch settlers returned to Europe because of the violence. In 1647, Peter Stuyvesant became the new leader of New Netherland. He had a conflict with a Swedish colony along the Del Delaware River. He believed the colony was on Dutch territory. He had a fort built in the area. When the Swedes took over the fort, Stuyvesant sent a force to take over the Swedish colony, which had log cabins that were later widely copied. As English colonies in North America grew, some English leaders became interested in New Netherland. England and the Netherlands fought wars in Europe in, six, in the 1600s. In 1664, the brother of king, the King of England sent four warships to New Amsterdam, New Amsterdam Harbor. His troops demanded that Stuyvesant surrender the entire Dutch colony. Stuyvesant wanted to fight, but his colonists instead surrendered. Most stayed in North America living under British rule. Let's go ahead and look at then and now the Northwest Passage. So although there is a Northwest Passage from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, it was nearly impossible to pass through during the age of the European exploration. This is because the passage lies far to the north and was usually covered by Arctic ice. The illustration at the upper right shows a Dutch explorer stuck in this ice in the 1500s. But with the gradual melting of the Arctic ice cap in the recent years, the Northwest Passage is now nearly ice free during the summer. Ships are able to travel through the passage in warmer months. The photograph at the lower right shows the Northwest Passage in August of 2016. So you can see how they were able to go way up north above North America and travel through um, North America to get over to the um, to Asia. The founding of New France. After Giovanni de Verrazzano failed to find the Northwest Passage for France, the King of France sent Jacques Cartier in 1534 to continue the search. Cartier explored what is now Canada, sailing up the St. Lawrence River. The French adapted the name Canada from the Huron group of native peoples. In the Huron language, Canada means village. And so this map shows France's first fort in Quebec, Canada. The next important French explorer in Canada was Samuel de Champlain. Henry or King Henry VI of France appointed him governor of French settlements in North America called New France. Champlain made four voyages to North America. On one voyage, he established a colony in what is now Quebec City. Champlain was, one, was on friendly terms with the native peoples. This allowed the French to expand their fur trade. On another voyage, Champlain brought along a young explorer named Etune Bruel. In 1615, he sent Bruel to continue the search for a passage to Asia. Bruel was unable to find it, but he did explore what are now Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and Lake Superior. In 1634, a French explorer named Jean Nicolette explored what is now Lake Michigan. Although some French people moved to Canada, growth was slow. French rulers were disappointed that Cartier could, could find neither gold nor a Northwest Passage. The focus of New France's economy continued to be the fur trade, and only a few large settlements thrived. 
Let's go ahead and take a look at the map so you can kind of see where in North America this map is um, pulled from. So let's look at the map key over here. So we have New France, which is all of this in green. Okay, and you can see um, the Great Lakes here, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and then Lake Michigan there. Um, you can see the different passages um, that the different explorers took. So Entain Bruel was in the red here. Okay, Jean Nicolette was in the yellow. And then of course, Marquette and Joliet were in the purple. Continuing on with the lost English colony. After the voyages of John, John Cabot and Henry Hudson, England did little to explore North America until the 1580s. Then an English noble named Sir Walter Raleigh asked Queen Elizabeth I for permission to establish a colony in North America. Raleigh wanted to create settlements that would serve as bases to explore for treasure and to attack the ships of Spain, an enemy of England. The English granted Raleigh a charter, which is a document that allowed him to found a colony. In 1585, Raleigh sent a group of men to North America to start the colony. They chose an island called Roanoke in what is now North Carolina. The colonists were not skilled at farming, and so they tried to get goods by trading with native peoples. The native peoples lost interest in trading, and the colonists decided they had to steal food from them. This led to fighting. After a difficult war, the colonists returned to England in 1586. And there is a picture of Sir Walter Raleigh. And this is a painting of when John White arrives in Roanoke to find the colony abandoned. And we'll read about that on the next page. So after that first set of colonists um, returned to England after the, the war broke out between the colonists and the Native Americans, um, we lead up to 1587. So in 1587, another group of colonists led by John White returned to Roanoke. This time, the group included women and children. The colony again had difficulty finding enough food. White sailed back to England to get supplies. But while he was there, war broke out between England and Spain. England needed all of its ships for the war. So by the time White returned to the colony three years later, in 1590, it had been abandoned. The only clue was the word Croatoan carved on a tree. The Croatoan were a native people in the area. What happened to the English settlers has never been determined. So I want you to look at the stop and check. In your opinion, why did the Roanoke colony fail? Why were people not able to survive there and to make that colony thrive? 